Knowing that the challenges of Omicron, knowing that vaccination is the most important tool, let's also talk about another crucial piece of the equation, which is testing. Testing helps us on so many levels. It helps to make sure that each person knows where they stand on a very personal level. When you get tested, you know what's going on, you know what to do. If you test positive, there's so much support there for you through our test and trace core. Uh, we'll get whatever you need, whether it is a hotel room to isolate in, whether it is food, medical support, uh, amazing array of supports all for free. So if you test positive, there's a lot of help available for you. If you test negative, great, you know you don't have COVID. But getting tested is absolutely crucial and making sure we have enough sites, enough resources, enough test kits. We're working on all these fronts. And not a surprise, we're finding the supplies are becoming a challenge because all over the country, testing is going up suddenly and we're seeing a supply problem that needs to be addressed and we're working on that, working with the White House, uh, working with the private sector to get more supplies. But what we do know is we want to maximize the number of places that New Yorkers can get tested. So as of now, we have uh, sponsored by the city of New York 89 testing sites in all five boroughs. Those are both the brick and mortar sites and the mobile sites. 23 more sites are coming online this week. Three more mobile sites and 20 more brick and mortar sites. So uh, by the end of this week, we're going to have 112, 112 city run sites uh, in healthcare facilities, but also in other community settings, uh, schools, libraries, community centers, you name it. So there'll be 112 test sites up. Uh, by the end of this week. To find a site near you, you can go to nyc.gov slash COVID test. And we're going to keep expanding test capacity constantly as we fight Omicron and as we get more and more supply in, including in-home testing, which is going to be a really key piece of this puzzle, but another area where we got to get a lot more supply to meet the demand we are experiencing now. Um, we are now testing, in fact, more people than ever. 130,000 plus daily in the city sites. That is double the number of tests just three weeks ago. That's how fast things are ramping up. Uh, this intense effort will keep growing as long as we need it to grow to address the demand. And what we're trying to do as much as possible is get those in-home test kits in play, particularly where we're seeing long lines. Wherever possible, we're trying to, particularly at our city-run sites, if there's a long line, offer people the alternative of giving them an in-home test that they can take home with them. Again, we need to get that supply up quickly to uh, allow that to be an option for more and more people. But another reminder, testing is really important, particularly around the holiday season, to make sure you're in good shape to go visit everyone else and to make sure your loved ones are going to be safe. And obviously, as per usual, if anyone is not feeling well, uh, don't come in contact with other folks. You know, stay, stay away from them while you get tested, while you find out what's going on. Uh, if you test positive, you need to quarantine. We'll be there for you. If you test negative, great. But testing becomes even more important in terms of protecting each other and those we love in our families. I want you to hear uh, more from uh, our city's doctor on how to stay safe, particularly in this holiday season. My pleasure to introduce our health commissioner, Dr. Dave Choksi. Thank you so much, as always, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and well, look, I know how much people have been looking forward to the holidays, uh, but Omicron has changed the landscape and led to anxiety and confusion. So here's my best advice about navigating the coming days and weeks. First, plan your holidays around your most vulnerable family member. That may mean hosting a virtual gathering or moving activities outdoors or using masks, same day tests and distancing. I do advise older adults and others at higher risk to skip optional activities, particularly in crowded settings, at least for the next few weeks. For my own family, we've made some adjustments to holiday plans around my young daughter, who isn't yet eligible for vaccination. We decided to postpone some out-of-town travel until sometime in the new year, though we will still find ways to spend time with family, both locally and virtually. Second, common sense precautions can help us lower risk and still enjoy holiday festivities more safely. Beyond meeting up outdoors, you can improve ventilation by opening up windows and doors 
and you can limit gatherings only to those who are fully vaccinated to help reduce risk. Tests, high quality masks and distancing add more layers of safety as do booster doses. And I wanted to make sure to highlight the preliminary evidence announced by Moderna today that booster doses likely offer significant additional protection against the Omicron variant. Third, the people that I am most worried about with Omicron are those that remain unvaccinated. Please take extra precautions for yourself and for the safety of others, like avoiding travel. And remember that it's never too late to get vaccinated. Regular testing is particularly important for those who aren't yet fully vaccinated. Since demand for testing is high, consider taking regular home self-tests since supplies will increase. And if you test positive after taking a home self-test, you should call your provider or call us at 212-COVID-19 in order to be linked to care. This holiday may not be the one that we envisioned, but we can still make it a safe one and a healthy one, and of course, an enjoyable one. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, doctor. Thanks, as always, for helping the people of the city know how to handle uh, these challenging situations and never changing situations. But I will emphasize what Dr. Choksi said. This is something we expect to be a matter of weeks, and we're going to overcome this as we have overcome every other challenge along the way. And, and I want to say one more thing about testing. It's our obligation, all of us who work for the city of New York, to make sure we get testing right. And yesterday I got some very good questions from members of the media uh, on concerns about test sites and things we have to do better. Uh, we've been working since uh, yesterday afternoon to make some immediate improvements. And I want to say thank you uh, to the members of the media who raised those questions and concerns because it helps us to serve the public better. A uh, special thank you to Mara Gay of the New York Times who had some very specific suggestions about how we could improve the oversight of some of the sites, which in fact we are going to implement right away. So starting today, uh, we're sending out supervisors uh, from Test and Trace Corps to all of our private vendor test sites to make sure we have another measure of accountability. Again, we overall have had very good results from our test sites, including those run by vendors. But we want to make sure we have our eyes on them every day to make sure there's high quality and consistency and that the hours are as stated. Uh, we also know there have been particular challenges because as Omicron is spreading, some of the people actually work at the test sites have been sick and have been out. We are establishing a, a core of reserve uh, professionals that we can put into play quickly to keep each site to its stated hours. So uh, we're going to be doing more to make sure there's continuity, consistency, quality at the test sites. But we welcome the feedback from the media and we welcome the feedback from all New Yorkers to know how we can do better. And we're going to keep making adjustments and improvements every step along the way as we fight through this challenge like we fought through all of them before. Okay, now, I'm going to something very different now, and this is about someone who has fought a very noble fight uh, for many years and with tremendous positive impact on all of us. And um, there are people who have changed the world in many ways. Some people change our consciousness, our minds. Some people create not just a uh, specific moment of change, but a whole movement. Some people change things in a way that is profound. Well, this is a very special moment, a very special honor for me uh, to recognize a New Yorker who has changed the world uh, to its core and is the definition to me of what uh, an effective activist does including not only calling for change and acting for change and organizing for change, but always showing uh, a love for humanity in the process, a hope and a belief that we can make the change. Now, like so many great New Yorkers, she didn't happen to be born here. She was born in Toledo, Ohio, and came to New York City like so many others, uh, seeing a chance to make an impact here and, and live a life where she could fulfill her full potential and she certainly did that. <laughs> so, uh, internationally renowned as a political leader, as a writer, as someone who defined feminism for this whole country and this whole world. Uh, but also, and very importantly, uh, unlike some other people who focused on one piece or another of the social change puzzle, 
Uh, she always focused on what we now call intersectionality. She now always focused on the challenges of race and class as well, and talked about how we bring together the changes we need across all these parts of our society. Uh, she stood with me as we announced the Commission on Gender Equity in 2015. She stood with me again in 2019 as we called for paid personal leave, a fight that will continue. Uh, but we're talking about someone who has been a champion for just the best of what we all can be and must be. Uh, I'm going to talk about Gloria Steinem in a moment. But before I do, I want to, and I'm going to provide this honor to her, but before I do, I want to turn to someone who is my partner in all things, uh, who has also led from the beginning of her life a vision of social change and what feminism means in real life and in practice that can reach so many people, and who said to me when we were thinking about uh, the great New Yorkers who should be honored as we end our administration, uh, Charlene McRae said, you know, I can't think of anyone who's done more good for the world than Gloria Steinem. And she is right. My pleasure to introduce our First Lady, Charlene McRae. Thank you, Bill. Can you hear me? Indeed we can. Thank you, Bill. Good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm so glad I could join you this morning. Today is a special day for New Yorkers all over our city. Gloria is greatly admired and has influenced and transformed many lives over the years. Like many young women, I was inspired by the feminist movement and the dynamic activism of Gloria Steinem, along with others like Flo Kennedy, Bella Absol, Shirley Chisholm, and so many others. They were outrageous and in a good way, and, and models of, of courage and focus. I know I'm not alone when I say it was important to see women like Gloria who demanded respect and took it upon themselves to raise our collective consciousness. It was important to see women who showed the nation that racial justice, gender equality, and the dignity of all people go hand in hand. They inspired me then, and they inspire me today. So I thank Gloria for her support. I appreciate how she was there for me and for this administration from the very beginning. It's been a great joy to get to know her these past eight years and stand with her, whether it was to support survivors of gender-based violence or to demand flexibility for families with paid personal time. Her voice has always been pivotal because when Gloria Steinem speaks, people listen. I thank her for a lifetime, truly a lifetime of leadership. And I thank her for showing us that when someone says it can't be done, we should ignore them. She is a really brilliant, brave, and incredible person who embodies the values of our great city. And for that, we praise and honor her. Thank you, Gloria Steinem. Back to you, Bill. And thank you, Charlene McRae. <laughs> and the last thing I want to say is very personal. Charlene and I, over the years, um, in dealing with all the challenges that come with leading this city, uh, there's times when you know we've needed to look to people who really light the way and, and show you how to be an agent for change, but again, in a way that is so um, embracing and so hopeful. And uh, in all of the times we've spent with Gloria, we've come away inspired, come away a little more energized, a little more hopeful on a very personal level. And we always say, Shirley and I always say, there are some angels in the world who uh, help us all to keep going and be our best selves. And for us as a family, Gloria Steinem has been one of those angels. So with that, I will now move across the stage. <laughs> and Gloria, it is my great honor to present to you on behalf of all of the people of New York City, the key to New York City. Me, yes, indeed, please. The floor is yours. Okay. Well, there is no city on earth uh, in which I would be more honored to live. Why don't you sit down oh, I get to sit down? Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> um, uh, even when I was in Toledo, Ohio, as you point out, 
I was dreaming of living in New York City. I was reading the New York Times, <laughs> hoping one day I would live here. And I must say that you, I've, se I've seen a lot of, I'm an old person, I've seen a lot of mayors, right? And you are the only mayor who has ever valued and talked about early childhood education. Yeah. I am so, so grateful for that. And um, I can't imagine uh, living in another place. I love, I love this city. And it is a spirit now that is helping us through a very tough year. This is the, the example of courage in the world and of wisdom and of safety. I thank you so much for that. I'm going to do my best to live up to this glorious key. It's a little big to wear. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a high point of my very long life, and I thank you. Thank you. Your very good life, and I want to thank our friends from Betty who have joined, <coughs> who are fabulous. Yes, this, this, Thank you. The singing group Betty, right? Yes, the singing group Betty. <coughs> and Mona Senna, who represents two continents. <coughs> and you know Carol, right? Yes, you have, you have your whole gang. <laughs> <laughs> but we are so appreciative <coughs> to you. And you. you keep lighting the way. You just don't stop. And I think that's one more thing I want to say. Gloria, I, I have always admired, you know, you could have, you could have years and years ago said, hey, I've made my contribution. And you would have been able to do so with uh, tremendous respect and renown, and you could have just said that's enough. But every time I go to a rally, you're there. <laughs> you know? and, and every time someone needs to speak up, you're there. And I, just, I think for all of us who think about this as a lifelong mission, uh, you're the exemplar of that. So thank you. All right, good news in the world, even as we deal with our challenges. Uh, let's talk about our indicators. The first one, always my favorite, a great number today, 12,974,734 doses to date uh, administered, and we expect a lot more. Again, people getting out there, getting those boosters, uh, mandates coming into effect. That number we want to keep pushing up, pushing up. But here are the challenges. Uh, number two, daily number of people admitted to New York City hospitals for suspected COVID-19. Today's report, 193 patients. Confirmed positivity, 35.05%. Hospitalization rate per 100,000 New Yorkers is now 1.80. Uh, and then new reported cases on a seven-day average. This increase we've talked about very sudden. We expect that to continue for a period of weeks. Today's report, 6,989 cases. Now, a few words in Spanish about the importance of getting vaccinated to address Omicron. Las vacunas son la mejor manera de detener a Omicron. También estamos llevando más pruebas y a más de 100 sitios en la ciudad. Manténgase seguro y saludable. Vacúnase y hágase la prueba antes de los días de fiesta. With that, let's turn to our colleagues in the media. And please let me know the name and outlet of each journalist. Good morning. We will now begin our Q&A. As a reminder, we are joined by Health Commissioner Dr. Dave Choksi, Dr. Mitch Katz, President and CEO of New York City Health and Hospitals, and Dr. Ted Long, Director of New York City's Test and Trace. Our first question for today goes to Andrew Siff from NBC. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and everyone on the call. Can you hear me? Yes, Andrew. How are you doing today? Doing well. Thanks for asking. I want to drill down on the problems in terms of the long lines for testing and the lack of avail availability in many neighborhoods across the city. Did your office or the health department make a conscious decision last month to scale down testing by 20 sites? And if so, why was that decision made, given that even without Omicron, there was going to be a surge in testing demand ahead of the holidays? You know, Andrew, uh, let me start, and I'll turn to Dr. Mitch Katz in a moment. Um, we saw a very decreased demand at some of the sites. 
We moved to a focus on mobile sites where we're getting really good results. Uh, and obviously, Omicron then changed the whole picture, and we started to ramp everything up again, and we are quickly ramping up. So we were responding to the experiences we were having, and we did not, and I've been very clear about this in what I said yesterday, we did not expect Omicron to move quite this quickly. And so we are moving quickly to uh, adjust, but we will. Dr. Katz. Can we hear? Dr. Yes, sir, thank you so much. Well, I'm as, as cranky and demanding as any uh, born in New York City person. Uh, but, you know, I have to say uh, the test and trace uh, core doubled in the last three weeks uh, its testing capacity. And I acknowledge that in, and that was just in three weeks, sir, that we did twice as many tests. Um, so, yes, I'm sorry uh, that demand uh, was so enormous over the last few days. We did not anticipate so much news about Omicron. We did not anticipate uh, that the supply chain would run out of um, the home tests. Uh, in my own pharmacies last week, there were shelves and shelves of home tests uh, to take care of the demand. When I went by yesterday, there were none. So yes, we had a lot of people online and we appreciate that. We appreciate that New Yorkers wanted to get tested, that they're following your guidance. I'm very pleased to say we're going to be opening uh, new testing sites all of this week uh, so that we have more than 100 testing sites going. Uh, we have moved more to mobile uh, testing sites, uh, and we do constantly close testing sites and move them to places where the demand is, and that's part of our model. So when someone says, well, we closed X site, that's only because our own community advisory board said you're going to reach more people if you move from here to there. So we constantly are moving them to try to reach New Yorkers in the greatest of need. We're going to keep expanding to meet that need. Uh, and I feel really confident that New Yorkers this week will have a different experience than they did this weekend. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Go ahead, Andrew. When it comes to your assessment that Omicron is mild and it's, it's still based on, on preliminary data, is this primarily looking at the hospitalization rates in South Africa and other countries right now? Is this from lab analysis of how it's interacting with people who are contracting it? How concerned are you that that conclusion might be premature? Uh, that's a great question, Andrew. I'm going to go back to Dr. Katz in a moment, but let me say this. Um, we have looked at all the things you mentioned. We've looked at the, the research that's been done. We've looked at the experience in South Africa. We've looked at our own experience already here in the city on the ground. And that's what we're seeing so far. I, I think it's absolutely right to say that's preliminary. Absolutely right to say we're going to constantly need to learn more because that's the whole story of COVID for two years. But we are seeing, certainly right now in our hospitals, uh, much better outcomes uh, than what we would have feared and certainly than what we experienced not only in the spring of 2020, but even last winter. Uh, we're seeing a much, much better experience. So that's what we know so far, uh, but we are going to be vigilant and always looking for more evidence. Dr. Katz. Yes, sir. As you say, uh, COVID, if it teaches nothing, it teaches humility. So we are you know, constantly looking at data. We could be wrong, but at this moment, it certainly looks like Omicron does not cause as severe disease uh, as we've seen with Delta. Uh, one of the things that's positive is in general, it seems that when people are in the hospital, they have shorter stays. They do not need as intensive treatment as what we've seen before. That part of that is that our own treatments are better. Part of it is that more of the people who get hospitalized uh, now have been vaccinated, and so they have immunity or they have uh, prior uh, exposure to the virus and they do not get as sick. So that has made a, it a major difference when people don't need to stay in the hospital as long. It prevents the hospitals from being overwhelmed. I think we'll know the answer in a week or two of exactly what proportion of New Yorkers who get 
COVID wind up sick enough to be in the hospital. Uh, but I can assure you, sir, that all of our hospitals have plans for how we will expand. Uh, we worked on it all weekends. We're doing fine right now, but if we do have to expand, I'll remind New Yorkers that when Health and Hospital had to triple our ICUs in six weeks, we tripled our ICUs in three weeks. We're prepared, we know how to do this. Uh, if we have to do it, we will, but at least so far, sir, it looks like it will not be necessary to have that level of expansion. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question goes to James Ford from PIX11. And good morning, Mr. Mayor and everyone on the call. Can you hear me okay? Yes, James, you sound like you're on site somewhere. Uh, that is actually true. Uh, and by the way, congratulations to Ms. Steinem and unrelated, my regrets for not being able to see you this evening with the appropriately canceled uh, holiday reception for the press corps. We shall, we shall, meet, the but we shall meet again. <laughs> uh, I look forward. On to the questions. Uh, can you elaborate further about this supervision by the city of private testing sites beyond just making sure that they are where they say they're going to be and keep their, their hours? Is there more that can be done between the city regarding the sites, including letting people know where letting citizens of New York City know where those sites are and when they're supposed to be operating and ensuring that those sites return results in a timely manner. Really important question. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna call upon first Mitch Cass, then Ted Long, and I, I wanna do this. Um, you, you asked two pieces that both matter a lot. One, how do we make sure things are functioning well and that the public knows uh, if they're going to a site at the assigned hours, they're gonna get a quality experience on time, et cetera. And then of course, getting the results back. And I think the results question, uh, James, is very different if you go to a public sector site than if you go to say an urgent care. We're seeing a radically different timeline. We're getting much faster results out of our city sponsored sites than some of the private sites. So I want both Mitch and Ted to speak to it, with, but I wanna start with Mitch because on the question of how you supervise and maintain quality control, I wanna remind you that Dr. Mitch Katz runs by far the largest public health system in America. And making sure all the pieces of this far-flung enterprise are working and working well is what he does for a living. And obviously he and his team and, and Ted running a test and trace have applied those same principles to make sure these private vendors are doing their job. So, Mitch, if you could speak to how you make sure all the sites, including the private sites, are running well. And Ted, if you could particularly talk about the response time and the turnaround time on the tests. Yes, sir, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, just to give a little bit of background, health and hospitals run some very large uh, testing sites like Bellevue. And when somebody is out sick, it's very easy for me to replace that person. So a large site, lots of nurses, lots of registration people, a huge ability to move people around. But we also want to have some small sites because we can't have a Bellevue hospital on every block. And so part of our strategy of making testing as available as possible is having many of these markedly smaller sites. And what we experienced yesterday was that sites that might have, say, two people doing nasal swabs, one of the persons is sick because of COVID. Not their fault, not anybody's fault. It's Sunday morning, they're sick, they call in, they can't come in. Those settings are more difficult, of course, for us to be able to immediately respond because they're not part of a large hospital where you can divert people from one function to another. So what you, uh, you've announced, uh, Mayor, and we want to be clear, is what we're going to do is we're going to send supervisors all around to the other uh, sites, the smaller sites, so that we can constantly re equilibrate staff and we can move people from one place to another uh, and also keep the public informed. Sometimes we've experienced moments where one site is very busy, but if people went to another site, they would experience a markedly shorter line. 
So we want to make sure that people constantly have the correct information and know where they can go for testing. And uh, I know Ted is going to uh, talk about the response rates, but I'll just say how proud we are every time we hear someone say, wow, I got my results in one day uh, at health and hospitals, but uh, my friend went to a private site and they're still waiting three days later for results. Uh, our response times are doing great. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and go ahead, Dr. Ted Long. Yeah, thank you, sir. Just to emphasize what Mitch is saying, uh, when our staff call out, we're going to be holding back staff and deploying them based on our, our structure here. And that's why we were bringing in more mobile units too. Our staff are heroes. They take risks coming to work every day because they're testing people with COVID. So I just wanted to say that, you know, I'm proud of our staff. And if they call out, it's because they themselves got COVID, but they're doing so much for our city. And I, I'm very thankful that we have them. Um, now, in terms of our turnaround times, the fastest turnaround times in New York City are at our public sites. Uh, if I was to give you one piece of advice, I would say go to nyc.gov backslash COVID test, find one of my sites, come here. Uh, we, we built our own lab to, keep, to control turnaround times, which are now around 24, sometimes uh, up to 36 hours, but that's some of the fastest turnaround times for PCRs across the city. So uh, come see us. All right, thank you. Go ahead, James. Thank you. Uh, and then a related question on behalf of my colleague, uh, Henry Rossoff. Uh, what are the specific criteria for more drastic actions, including capacity limits and lockdowns? And are you hesitant at all to go there in your final days in office? Uh, because it seems as if most leaders at this point are not really willing to cross that line. Yeah, it's be, I want to be very clear, James. I appreciate the question a lot. It's, it's not about um, final days in office. It's not about uh, what leaders are willing to do. It's about what's the right thing to do and what's the right strategy uh, to both save lives and also protect livelihoods. Uh, we should avoid lockdowns. We should avoid shutdowns. We should avoid restrictions. I've said this now for weeks and weeks. We can avoid all those things by getting more people vaccinated. So I think there's a really sharp juxtaposition, James. I, I've been saying for a long time, uh, vaccination equals freedom. You get vaccinated, you have more personal opportunities. You get vaccinated, your whole neighborhood, your whole city can do more, can come back more, can recover more, can maintain our life. And that's why we've been so focused on getting more and more people vaccinated. That's why we've used strong measures, incentives, mandates, everything we've got. So in fact, we're gonna double down now on vaccination to avoid shutdowns, to avoid restrictions. Uh, I do not see a scenario for any kind of shutdown uh, because we are so vaccinated as a city and because we have the ability to get a lot more vaccinated. That's where our energy should go. Another shutdown would have horrible, horrible impacts on the people of this city. But more importantly, it's not necessary if we keep getting more and more people vaccinated, we keep ensuring that people get tested, we keep reinforcing our hospital system, which is doing very, very well. Uh, we don't want to shut down, we want to vaccinate. Simple as that. Our next question goes to Jenna DeAngelis from CBS. Hi, Mayor de Blasio. Wanted to know your thoughts on having the Billy Joel concert proceed at MSG tonight. A big event, obviously, with people singing and drinking and taking masks off. Just your thoughts. Uh, Jenna, I think the first thing I'd say is that you've got a vaccine mandate for all indoor entertainment. And when you're talking about all vaccinated people, uh, you're having a very different discussion right there. Uh, the challenge right now is for the unvaccinated. And the challenge is when unvaccinated people are together with vaccinated people. But in that kind of setting, it is all vaccinated people, and that is absolutely crucial. Now, I would urge everyone, keep their masks on, obviously, except for when they're eating or drinking something. Uh, make sure if anyone's not feeling well, don't go to that concert, you know, all the basics. But right now, again, we want to keep this city moving forward, but in a safe manner. That means the focus on vaccination. Go ahead, Jen. And also wondering if a plan is in place yet for New Year's Eve. Obviously, that's on a lot of people's minds heading into the holidays. 
Yeah, Jenna, again, your New Year's Eve, right now, the starting point is we have the original plan that we announced uh, with the crucial uh, good elements, all vaccination, vaccinated folks only, and outdoors. But we are looking at that again now in light of Omicron. I've said we'll make a final decision. We'll announce it certainly before Christmas. We're working closely with the Times Square Alliance. Uh, so folks who are planning on be there, being there, be ready to. But if we have to modify those plans in any way, we're certainly going to let people know that in just the next few days. Our next question goes to Christina Vega from Chalkbeat. Hi, Mayor. Thanks for taking my question. You opened this uh, press conference saying to expect a rapid increase in cases, and that seems to be happening in schools right now. Uh, we're also hearing from lots of school leaders that uh, the Situation Room is taking a long time to respond to positive cases, and I understand from the UFT that staffing for the Situation Room won't be fully ram ramped up until the new year. So my question to you is what can be done this week? Uh, students are in, are in school until Thursday. What can be done this week to make sure that schools um, are equipped to handle this increase in cases? Yeah, thank you, Christina. I'll start and I'll turn to Dr. Choksi in a second. First of all, let's start with the most important fact, uh, that gold standard of health and safety measures in place in all our schools and the fact that all adults in our schools are vaccinated. That is why at this moment, uh, positivity levels in the school lower than anywhere else in the city. Uh, we have, as of this morning, four schools closed out of 1,600 um, and a positivity level just over 1%, obviously uh, compared to a much higher level for the city. Um, the Situation Room has been beefed up immediately. We saw just literally between you know Monday and Friday of last week a big sudden uptick in cases. We immediately beefed up the Situation Room and more help is coming quickly. Um, so we can certainly manage these next few days. And then there is a natural break, obviously, uh, between the end of Thursday and when school comes back in January. So we'll have time to beef it up further. But I really want to emphasize how safe the schools are um, and really give credit to everyone in the school community. Uh, when we brought back school uh, September 2020, a uh, Herculean task and our school communities did an amazing job keeping kids safe and, and making something happen under really difficult circumstances. They did the extraordinary this last September 2021, bringing back schools full strength while we were still dealing with COVID and making them incredibly safe. So kudos to all the folks in the school communities of this city who did that. Dr. Choksi, why don't you add to what I've said? Thank you so much, sir. I, I just want to pick up where you left off, though, which is to recognize uh, the, the heroic efforts of our school staff um, who are delivering uh, absolutely necessary, essential services for uh, the kids of New York City. Uh, they've dealt with so many challenges over the past two years uh, and handled them with such aplomb. And that extends to uh, the staff that are supporting them in the Situation Room. Uh, we've doubled uh, the overall number of staff in the Situation Room and we'll continue to expand that as needed uh, in order to be able to, uh, to support principals and other school leadership uh, with, um, with the, the increase in cases that we're seeing citywide. There are a couple of things that I want to emphasize, which are important not just for the short term, but also for the longer term. Uh, the first is to reiterate our guidance that um, for anyone who is feeling ill, um, meaning parents, if your child is feeling ill, please keep them home, uh, even if it's relatively mild symptoms, uh, because that makes a big difference for the entire school community. The second is to underline our push for uh, vaccinating uh, even more kids across New York City. As the mayor mentioned, 600,000 New York City children uh, are uh, vaccinated with at least one dose already, uh, but we're gonna uh, make even more concerted efforts, particularly for five to 11 year olds. So the bottom line is that um, our schools are uh, some of the safest places for our students as well as our staff to be. It's because of those strict layered protocols that we have. Um, and we're gonna continue to do what we need to to meet the moment uh, with Omicron. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, Christina, you have another. Thanks. Um, so we just heard the health commissioner encouraging folks to keep their kids home if they're not feeling well. On that note, we're hearing 
that schools are all responding to this increase in cases in their own way. Some are offering excused absences and remote work uh, for those who are staying home out of health concerns um, and others are not. Um, obviously, uh, it's not great if kids are home without any instruction. So can, can schools expect or can parents expect any policy guidance to ensure that kids have um, even access to instruction during this time? Yeah, I mean, look, um, Christina, clearly our school communities had to, beginning with the absolute shock of March 2020, uh, come up with a variety of tools to support kids and uh, continue to improve upon those tools. So right now we're talking about a four-day uh, week this week because uh, New Year's Eve is off. And again, overwhelmingly, we started this morning, uh, all of our schools open except for four out of 1,600. Uh, we had uh, a meaningful number of classroom closures, but uh, overwhelmingly, the vast, vast, vast majority of our classrooms open. So um, there will be some kids in the course this week that need uh, to do things remotely, and each school has come up with their own ways of doing that. But I think we should see this week as a time where all the tools we have in place can serve us well. Uh, what we need to do is, of course, prepare for when kids come back in January. And that's going to overlap with several weeks of Omicron being at a very high level. But then, based on everything we're seeing now, uh, by the end of January, Omicron should be dissipating and we should be seeing uh, things get more back to normal. Now, again, that's based on the information we have now. So I want to emphasize that we're dealing with a temporary phenomenon. We have tremendous tools to deal with it because school communities have been so safe when a school closes, obviously everything goes remote. Uh, when a whole classroom closes, that goes remote. We have those tools in place. But the final thing I want to say, Christina, and I really think this is a lot of the heart of the matter right now, every adult in our schools vaccinated. And we want to get boosted if they qualify. Today's number on the 12 to 17 year olds, 83%. Amazing. Want to go up, but that's a great number. The area where we need more help is from parents of 5 to 11 year olds. We're at this point just over 27% of that group vaccinated. Uh, we need those parents to get their kids vaccinated. Get them vaccinated now or get them vaccinated once school ends. But when we go back in January, I want to see that number way, way up because that's what's going to help keep school communities safe and keep schools moving forward. Our next question goes to Juliet Papa from 1010 Winds. Oh, hey, good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, everybody on the call. I, uh, I wanted to follow up on James Ford's question. So how are you checking on the accuracy of these private testing companies? Are they reliable? And what, what's the criteria for that? Uh, in terms of the companies that we uh, do our vendor relationships with, I'll start with Mitch Katz and go to Ted Long as well because I think this begs, again, the bigger question, uh, what Health and Hospitals does every day in their huge network uh, that they have to protect the health and welfare of New Yorkers. Uh, starting with Mitch, how you work with vendors to make sure they're doing their job, Ted, specifically about the test sites. Go ahead, Mitch. Uh, thank you, sir. And, and maybe I'll, I'll actually start for Juliet to just remind people that there are other private testers in New York City that are not affiliated with health and hospitals, and, and we're happy for that. Uh, we're happy for anyone to come and fill the need. We know New Yorkers need tests, uh, but we, we don't have the capability for guaranteeing um, those sites or those tests. What we can tell you is that if you go to any city-run site, whether it's health and hospitals or our sister department, uh, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the Test and Trace Corps, at those places, uh, first, the test is done in a very high-functioning lab, um, and I have great confidence in the results, um, and that we will be going out to all of the sites, uh, as Dr. Long explained, so that if there is somebody who is out sick, uh, we can replace that person. That was really the issue yesterday is that we unexpectedly had people out sick uh, and we need now to always have a reserve of people 
to replace uh, them to our vendor site. So we'll be going out, Juliet, we'll be checking on them. We always appreciate when the media or people tweet a long line, that always helps us. We're constantly moving resources around. We can't always accurately predict demand. We do our best, uh, but sometimes a particular community feels at risk and they go for testing and that's great, uh, but it makes the line longer. Uh, so I'll, I'm gonna turn to Dr. Long for more information about our process. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Long. Yeah, Julia, thank you for the question. So uh, we work closely with our vendors and, and from my perspective, they've been doing a great job. Again, the staff that, go, that test New Yorkers every day really are heroes. They're the ones testing in front of everybody with COVID. Now, in terms of how we work with our vendors, we even have a GPS system of tracking where the mobile units are. So we have a very good line of sight in knowing what's going on across our city. And now with one of the challenges, as Dr. Katz said, is that unfortunately some of our staff, again, that are the heroes, are getting Omicron or COVID themselves. So we're going to be deploying mobile units and additional staff to where they're needed the most, working with our vendors with a close supervision structure. But I'm confident this week is going to get better and better um, as we have a tighter and tighter structure in place. But I just really wanted to make the point, Juliet, our staff really are doing incredible work. Thank you. Go ahead, Juliet. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Mayor, I know you just talked about you're in discussions about New Year's Eve. Um, would you consider a hybrid New Year's Eve? You know, you would allow the outdoor activity, but no indoor activity? Well, again, we were talking about New Year's Eve, the, the formal event in Times Square. So I want to make sure, Juliet, there's no misunderstanding here. Uh, the I'm very, very clear about the city as a whole. The city is going to keep moving forward. I am against uh, shutdowns, against restrictions in favor of vaccination. And thank God we have the high level vaccination we have. And thank God we have put in place strong mandates to guarantee even more vaccination. Uh, so many, many things will be happening uh, during the holiday season. Uh, the key is for people to be vaccinated, for people to get tested. Again, if someone's not feeling well, uh, to stay home and to be really careful around folks who are particularly vulnerable. But for the New Year's Eve celebration in Times Square, the outdoor celebration that the eyes of the world are on, uh, we have what we've done historically for years and years. We have the kind of a model we used uh, last year. Uh, we're looking at anything that will make this work best, but right now, uh, it is on fully vaccinated um, outdoors, of course, that's the plan, but we're talking to Times Square Alliance. And if we need to make any other modif modifications, obviously working very closely with our healthcare leaders, we'll decide that in the course of this week, we'll announce it before Christmas. Our next question goes to Steve Burns from WCBS 880. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, how are you? Good, Steve, how are you doing? Doing all right. I uh, wanted to circle back on schools. You may have seen that uh, a few city council members held a press conference this morning saying basically we don't know what the picture is in schools right now in terms of COVID because there's not nearly enough testing happening right now. And the, the sampling that we get from students isn't nearly wide enough to be, you know, a representative picture. Uh, so I wanted to see if you could respond to that and, and, you know, what your level of confidence is that the amount of testing right now in school is adequate. I really respect the uh, elected officials who raised the concern, but I think the people can answer that best are our doctors. And this question has been asked in recent days and we've answered it squarely. We're testing in every school every week. The results are extraordinarily consistent uh, and show very low levels of COVID. So, you know, if we were not in every school every week and we were seeing wild variations in the numbers, I mean, we maybe have a different discussion, but I think scientifically, there's something has been extraordinarily clear here and it's for a reason. You have all those health and safety measures in place. You have every adult vaccinated. Uh, this is one of the safest places in the city by definition. It just, just the facts explain it. But it, let's let Dr. Choksi speak to the, the scientific question. Uh, do we have a good sample size? Do we have a good picture of what's going on in the schools? Dr. Choksi. Thank you, sir. And, and the short answer is that uh, we do uh, because of the testing that you've described. But let me back up for just one moment uh, and explain that 
uh, you know, anytime there are cases uh, associated with a school community, we do have to differentiate what's happening uh, because of community and household transmission from uh, what's happening with respect to uh, school transmission. Um, and the former, as we've been talking about now for days, uh, we are seeing a surge in cases across New York City. Um, we mentioned from the very beginning of identifying Omicron cases that based on what we knew about this variant, uh, that uh, we were going to see community spread very rapidly. And that is indeed what we are seeing. But when it comes to school transmission, um, I'll give you a few data points that help us to understand this. Uh, first, our in-school uh, testing positivity rate is at 1.18%. This is higher than what we've seen uh, in previous weeks, but it remains uh, relatively low. And another data point is that um, the number of, of full classroom closures that we have is 0.94% uh, of classrooms. So uh, although it is a significant number and we would want to keep as many open as possible, um, when you put it in that broader perspective, what that tells us is that um, hundreds of thousands of students are benefiting from in-person learning and doing so in a safe way because of the protocols that we have put in place. Uh, our goal is to make schools as safe as possible so that uh, our kids can benefit from uh, those, those uh, educational uh, and instructional um, times that are so important for them. Uh, so the bottom line is this, um, our schools uh, remain uh, among the safest places to be in New York City because of those layered precautions we're dealing with uh, Omicron as a city, you know, and in our communities, uh, and we've got to um, take both of those things in concert together. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Steve. Thank you very much. And going back to the test vendors that we're working with here, I can also speak from firsthand experience. I waited here in Sunset Park outside for two and a half hours. Staff took a 45-minute lunch break. This was uh, Saturday afternoon. Uh, Steve, given that you tell mentioned, us you know, options. Steve, yep. I'm sorry to interrupt. Tell us exactly uh, the site, if it was city run, if it was private, because that's going to help us as we follow up. Then, then continue sure, your it was, question. It was, uh, I believe, an ambulance mobile van uh, parked right outside Sunset Park, the park itself, which I believe is a, a city run contracted site that helps you at all. Thank you. Continue. Uh, so I know you said options are limited as far as supply goes. So. If these supervisors do go out and find problems, you know what what are your options from there in terms of consequences, finding a new provider? Um, you know, is the the option kind of limited from from here on out, or how do you kind of rectify the situation when you do find bad situations? Now, that's a really great question. I'm going to turn to Mitch Katz, but let me let me talk about this first. Um, I want to emphasize very humanly, a few weeks ago. We had a lot of sites where very few, few people were coming to get tested. And it's understandable if there's very little demand, uh, if people need a lunch break during the day or something like that under normal situations. But now we're seeing an extraordinary uptick in demand. We got to go on a war footing. Uh, I think my colleagues and I would all say, you know, if, if this a sudden surge caught us by surprise in terms of sheer ferocity, then that's on us to quickly rebound, make the adjustments, get uh, the personnel where they need to be. We do have the ability uh, to move a lot of personnel, and that's why I want Mitch to talk about this. He has a huge, huge workforce. He can make adjustments with that workforce to cover more places. In terms of the, the vendors and their sites, uh, they've got to create consistency. So uh, whereas maybe before a lunch break might have been acceptable, it's not acceptable. There's a long line of people and they just need more staffing and, and we need to demand that of them. That's on us to fix. You know, literally Monday last week, we didn't have this particular problem. We do have it this Monday, we gotta fix it. That's on us. But yes, there are, there is staffing to be found and to be put in play and we're doing that very quickly. Dr. Katz. Yes, sir, I can say, in three weeks, we doubled our testing capacity to deal with yesterday. I wish we could have quadrupled our testing capacity, but we are, we are definitely on it. And as you say, sir, it is up to us. Uh, let me reiterate that the people who do the, the testing, whether it's at our, one of our hospitals or 
through a vendor, these are in fact heroes. They are coming very close to people with COVID, uh, without their masks on, uh, because you, the, the, while the swabber has their mask on, the patient cannot because you're swabbing their nose. So it's not surprising that people got sick. Uh, none, none of what we found yesterday was uh, malfeasance. Everybody was trying to do their best. They just couldn't do it um, with the number of people. So we've now created an extra pool of people who we can send to replace people at lunch. People do have to take a lunch break, uh, but it is, as you say, sir, it's on us to replace that person uh, so that they can go and have their lunch, um, but that the testing line keeps moving. And uh, with uh, today, you'll see the sites will uh, run better. Uh, once we have enough home kits, that was a huge way we would make lines better by offering people home kits. Uh, they work quite well. Uh, and as soon as the supply improves on that, that will be another tool to make the lines go faster. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We have time for two more questions today. The next question goes to Amanda Eisenberg from Politico. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Good, Amanda. How you been? I'm good, thanks. Sad we won't be partying tonight, but you know, in the, in the sake of public health, we gotta do what we gotta do. We gotta do what we gotta do, but, but we'll always have volleyball, Amanda. That will be our memory. That is true. That is true. Um, Mr. Mayor, I wanted to go back to the, the questions around lockdowns. Um, Eric Adams earlier today had mentioned we can't have a lockdown every time there's a variant. However, what I'm hearing from um, one emergency room doctor at New York Presbyterian had said it's not really an issue of beds anymore, right? Like, we don't need to just open Javits again. It's a staffing issue. And he's concerned that if we see a surge of even mild cases coming into the hospitals, it could flatten the hospitals just based on solely staffing shortages. And so, you know, that's a harder challenge than just reopening ICU beds. So I was hoping you could comment on, you know, what does that look like in the case that we really are just seeing this massive volume rather than um, acuity of illness? The fantastic question. I appreciate it. Because this is a conversation that we have had ever since the spring of 2020. Uh, in those really, really tough days, Amanda, when it looked like we were going to have to massively increase our capacity, um, everyone was thinking at first it was literally physical space, it was beds, it was, you know, ventilators. That was all true, but what became clearer and clearer was actually the toughest challenge was staffing. So whenever we talk about how we're doing and where we're going, we actually make staffing the first consideration. You heard Dr. Katz earlier, it, it was quite possible for him to increase ICU capacity. He and his team at Health and Hospitals did that very, very agilely. Um, we have much better supply than we used to have, obviously, and, and thank God hospitals are able to handle the cases a lot better. The treatments are a lot better. You don't have as many people on ventilators. But staffing is a real issue. And you're going to have a lot of people out sick for brief periods of time with Omicron. So we've run this scenario a lot lately, talking about what it looks like. We still think, and I'll turn to Dr. Katz to elaborate, but we still think we're in strong shape because of the very high levels of vaccination, which do blunt the impact of COVID in general and Omicron specifically, uh, because the hospital is so much better at how they handle these cases. Therefore, the amount of staffing, Dr. Katz will talk about people are intubated, how much staffing it takes when someone is versus when they're not. If you're able to deal with the cases better, faster, it frees up staffing. So we do feel confident that we can sustain this hit for what we believe is only a period of weeks because of all those other uh, facts, especially the high level of vaccination. Dr. Katz. Yes, sir, you've explained it very well. It's all about staffing. Uh, in March 2020, it was not about physical space. It was all about staffing. And I am concerned about loss of staff uh, due to Omicron. So I'm not, at the moment, we're not seeing large numbers of hospitalized patients overwhelming us, but I am concerned that our own staff will get Omicron and then will need to be isolated, and that will result in our having fewer staff. But we have run the scenarios, as you say, uh, starting this week, health and hospitals will be moving to uh, almost all virtual visits in the ambulatory care area so that we can redeploy uh, nurses, 
um, and staff assistance into the hospitals as well as to our testing sites. Uh, we'll be able to maintain our appointments because doctors like myself and Dr. Long and Dr. Chotsky will keep seeing our patients virtually, um, but we won't need the same support staff. We'll maintain skeleton crews um, in our uh, clinics so that when people do need to come in, they can be seen. That will provide us additional staffing. Uh, we are currently increasing the number of registry staff uh, in anticipation that we may have losses uh, of our uh, healthcare heroes due to the illness. So we're, we're preparing that with additional staff. Uh, and it is making a huge difference that the people who are being admitted generally are not requiring ventilation. Uh, when people are on a ventilator, you generally need uh, one nurse at most uh, taking care of two patients. Uh, when somebody is just needing oxygen, uh, then one nurse can often take care of five, six patients well. So we're going to focus on uh, making sure that we deploy the correct staff, um, that we are moving, we will move patients around as necessary uh, to, to our different facilities. Uh, we, we are very agile. We know how to do this. Um, we are prepared. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Go ahead, Amanda. Great, thank you so much. And this is kind of a follow up. Um, I've been personally fielding a lot of questions from New Yorkers about reinfections and breakthrough cases. And I would love the medical professionals on this call to, to give better context than maybe I can as a layperson. Um, I was hoping that you might be able to explain like why Omicron infections are expected to trail off in the coming weeks. And also this to me seems like a flare up situation. And with uh, COVID becoming endemic, my understanding is we will just continue seeing flare-ups um, as we kind of, you know, move past this this main period of pandemic. So I was hoping to get a better understanding from the medical professionals just to explain, like, what kind of phase we are in the pandemic. What should New Yorkers expect in terms of should they expect to be like flu season where they they get vaccinated every year and people are going to get reinfected? And understanding the science is still evolving on this, but. I would really love just like a, a better explanation, a more succinct explanation about, you know, where we're, where we're at now and what New Yorkers should expect moving forward. Thank you. Very, very helpful big picture question. I'm going to start as the layman and then Dr. Katz and Dr. Choksi, because um, I've asked this question, Amanda, great minds think alike. I've been asking this question over months now, trying to hone sort of where are we going. My summary is this, uh, Omicron, uh, challenging few weeks, then starts to come down uh, toward the end of January. Um, the uh, cold weather lets up uh, starting in March and opens up more possibilities for us in terms of uh, starting to move away from COVID and uh, deep into recovery. The level of vaccination continues to rise markedly during this time because of folks hearing you know, the advice of the doctors and also uh, the strong vaccine mandates. So you put those pieces together, you're in position to start uh, 2022, go into the spring 2022 in a very different reality. Uh, our hope, based on all the conversations I've had with the doctors, is that in the course of 2022, you transfer to a reality where COVID is much more like the flu, as you described, where people need that annual shot or maybe a couple of shots a year as a maintenance uh, but it's much less central to our lives, uh, much more in the backdrop. But that really will depend, obviously, on what happens also around the country, around the world. We got to get vaccination levels up everywhere. But it's certainly possible that 2022 can be a transcendent year if there is a real push to deepen vaccination across the board. So that's my layman's uh, analysis. Now, Dr. Katz, followed by Dr. Choksi. Well, sir, I think your layman's analysis deserves a medical degree if just from the last two years that you've been going through this. Uh, I wish I could grant it to you, sir. I think you deserve it at this point. Thank you, brother. Uh, in, in terms of short term, uh, for reasons that no one really understands, COVID does seem to come in waves. Um, you know, we saw this dramatically in India. 
um, where very, very high, high rates of infection, hospitals running out of oxygen, horrible scenes, uh, so distressing to watch, and then less, and then less, and then less. Uh, nobody really understands exactly why you get the cycles. People raise issues of weather and, and uh, travel patterns and life patterns, but it's not really understood. It is clear, though, that COVID comes in waves. Uh, and that is South Africa is already, which had the earliest, some of the earliest and best data uh, because of the quality of their scientists there, have already noticed um, that the wave is diminishing. So that's why we believe that Omicron is going to be quite severe in the sense of infections, not as severe in terms of hospitalizations. Uh, it will probably get worse before it gets better in terms of number of infections. But then we believe within um, mid-January, uh, we'll start to see cases leveling off um, and things returning to our new normal. Uh, in terms of long-term picture, um, humans are very adaptable. We will learn how to coexist with um, the COVID virus, just as we've learned to coexist with the virus that caused the 1918 Spanish flu. It still circulates. Uh, humans have learned how to deal with it. Whether that means that we're going to need yearly immunizations, um, that I think is a likely possibility that the immunizations may need to change just as we changed the flu vaccine formulations. I think that's a likely possibility. Uh, we have a lot of hope uh, for some of the new medications which are likely to be approved by the FDA by the end of the year, that with these medications, we will be able, when someone tests positive, to be able to offer them a pill um, that they can take, which will markedly decrease the chance of serious illness. I think all of these things will eventually result in us being able to live with COVID. Uh, thank you, sir. I turn to my colleague, uh, Dr. Chotsky. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Katz. And you know, I agree um, with, with the summary that you provided. I'll just briefly um, make a couple of additional points to your thoughtful question, Amanda. Uh, and focus on Omicron, because that is, you know, the threat that is before us right now. Uh, yesterday, what I said was that we have to think about um, exposures, infection, and disease. And when it comes to exposures turning into infections, uh, what we're seeing is that Omicron is the fastest, fittest, and most formidable version of the virus that we've seen thus far. Um, that doesn't mean that we're powerless against it, and that's where uh, the precautions that we've talked about can really help us to slow the spread. Um, but particularly when it comes to infections turning into disease, that's where I want to rest a moment because it is uh, crucially important for us to understand how important uh, vaccination is, as well as hopefully additional treatments um, within the next few days to weeks. For vaccination, what we do see is that people who are fully vaccinated uh, do appear to have a significant protection against severe disease. That means needing oxygen or a hospital bed or a ventilator, uh, and that makes a, a very significant difference. The other thing that I want to emphasize is that we are not taking this passively, meaning we uh, as your public health leadership, but also we as a city. Um, and the thing that will help the most um, is for people who are fully vaccinated to go and get your booster dose, because that will also help us to weaken the link between infection turning into disease. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, for people who remain unvaccinated, that's where I get the most worried about those severe outcomes. And so today is the day, uh, you heard it from me before, to run, uh, don't walk, uh, to start getting the protection that vaccination affords. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our last question for today goes to Michael Gartland from The Daily News. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, everybody on the call. Um, thanks for taking my question. Um, I was uh, talking to a city worker today uh, who is curious if there are any plans in place for um, 
members of the city workforce to go back to remote. Uh, I mean, what I'd heard from this person was that many people are questioning why this isn't happening. And, and if there are plans in place or, or something you're talking about, how would that work? Uh, bottom line, Michael, we've got a city workforce that's 94% vaccinated, 94%. Uh, and we've got a city workforce that works in locations where there's a real focus on uh, health and safety measures. Uh, and we also need people at this moment especially uh, to serve their fellow New Yorkers to do everything that New Yorkers need uh, to get through this challenge. So that's our core, those are our core principles here. Um, we'll look at different options, but there's no uh, change to the approach right now. Obviously, uh, anyone who's not individually feeling well should stay home, and uh, supervisors will address their own situations in their own units, but uh, the overall approach uh, continues as is. Go ahead, Michael. Um, and I wanted to ask you also about um, Mayor-elect Adams' inauguration plans. Um, last I checked, he's planning to do his inauguration indoors at the King's Theater. Um, you know, as opposed to doing it outside City Hall, as as has been, you know, what's done in the past. Um, is this a good idea, given you know how quickly Omicron spreading? Um, do you think, you know, perhaps he should look at changing his plans? Uh, look, first of all, I'll say uh, Mayor Elect has been uh, constantly working with our team and with particularly our healthcare leadership to determine the best way uh, to go about things. And so, whatever final decision he makes, I know it will be based on the advice of the healthcare leaders. Uh, so, you know, let's let's let that play out. Obviously, there's some time to sort it out. Uh, but he has made it very, very clear that that's how he makes his decisions, and I commend him for that. Uh, so with that, I also want to say to everyone, uh, given everything that's going on with Omicron, uh, we are going to have another press conference uh, tomorrow. We had a reduced number of press conferences as we were closing out our administration, but given this immediate challenge, we'll, we're going to have another one tomorrow just to make sure we're providing some extra high level of information to people. And everyone, look, uh, New Yorkers should be so proud of what you have done these last two years to fight through this challenge. I think that last a dialogue we heard uh, in response to Amanda's question about where we're going with COVID was really important to remind us this is not forever. This is a period of time. Omicron's going to be, it looks like a very brief period of time. But the key is to help each other, support each other, and most importantly, get vaccinated, get that booster shot, get your child that vaccination. That's what makes a difference, and that's how we're going to make it through once again. Thank you, everybody.